NFL Week 9 is behind us. It's over. It's through. It's time for your NFL BLD review. What's going on, football fans? BLVers, it's Mitch here, back with another NFL Week review here on the bottom line view giving you my recap my reactions my thoughts my analysis all that and more including my rants for week nine so make sure you gronk spike the like button don't forget to subscribe these are my raw thoughts about the nfl right now and what just happened in week nine everyone was hyping up week nine Biggest week ever. You got a primetime game in every slot. We start off with Mike Vrabel versus Mike Tomlin. Then we go to system quarterback versus Tua. Then we've got the 12s taking on The Ravens. And then after that, you got Big Al's. Philadelphia. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Versus. The Dallas Cowboys. Dakota. And then. You got. Josh Allen. One man wrecking crew Madden cover Haley Steinfeld versus Joe Burrow, Joe Shiesty, Joe Cool himself in Cincinnati. And then you finish it off with Zach Wilson season versus Justin Herbert. That was week nine, man, and it was a week because I really feel like we learned so much. Truly, I believe we learned so much about the NFL this week in terms of how to categorize the good from the great, the elite from the very good. I feel like we now have a better understanding of that, and we still have a great recognition of the New England Patriots who suck. We will get to them at the end of the show. Why do I have to talk about this team, bro? Do, do I have to? Like, do you guys really want me to talk about the New England Patriots? Do you really want me to live stream their games? You're just putting me through torture. Let's get to Monday Night Football. Gronk spiked the like button. Pharaoh Brown it. All right, Monday Night. Okay, so guys, I get it. Everyone on Twitter. I I get it. Zach Wilson's not good. Yeah, we get it. We know. But, like, bro, every single person is watching this Jets game and blaming only Zach Wilson as if this offense isn't a pile of horse shit. Like, give me a break. It doesn't matter who you have at quarterback in there. Is it going to look respectable and better than it is? Will the quarterback be better than Zach? Of course. That is not the point. Zach Wilson is not good. He has improved, though. He has improved. And I actually thought he made quite a few nice throws in this game. Believe it or not. And he could have been sacked nine times instead of six times. But, you can't tell me that I'm the only person watching this Monday Night Football game. And I'm the only person that thinks it's not just Zach's fault. Like, have you watched this offensive line of the New York Jets? I mean, it stinks. The right tackle, Mitchell, is a pile of of donkey crap he sucks 
And then you've got old washed ass Lincoln Tomlinson at left guard getting bulldozed by one handed Joey Boza. And I mean, guys, look at it this way. You tell me in the comments. Be real. Be honest. How many NFL teams and NFL offenses have a worse offensive line and number two, number three, and number four receiver? Okay, so let's go through it. They've got Garrett Wilson. They've got Brees Hall. They've got a pile of donkey crap at offensive line. Running backs, Brees Hall, great. Okay, running back, does it really matter? We're still not sure. Wide receiver position outside of Garrett Wilson, who is really good. I would love to have Garrett Wilson on the Patriots. Number two is Alan Lazard, who stinks. If anyone thinks Alan Lazard is good at football, please leave this video. Please close your tab, swipe up on your app, bro, shut your phone off, throw it out the damn window, run it over with your car, come back here, and then tell me Alan Lazard is good at football. The guy stinks. He is terrible. He can't catch. He can't run. He can't... Uh, he's terrible. What does he do? And then you've got number three receiver... I didn't even know the guy. Who is this? Gibson? Who the f is that guy? Does it, and how did Miko Hardman not play here? Unbelievable. The, and then you got the tight ends. Conklin is slower than me running backwards. Uzoma could catch the ball in the end zone. No hands Magoo. I mean, holy cannoli, how many drops were in this game? Yes, I'm going there. Like, I am being the Zach Wilson defender because I feel like everyone else is just blaming everything on Zach. Bro, the Jets' offense stinks. It Aaron Rodgers could play in this offense. He'd get sacked multiple times a game. He'd probably get injured again because he'd get hit. The play calling is predictable as anything I've ever seen. Nathaniel Hackett is a booty coordinator. Booty. They run a basic West Coast offense where they run hitches, slants, and play action uh, crosser. Bro. The offense stinks. The scheme stinks. The offensive line stinks. The wide receiving core outside of Garrett Wilson stinks. So yeah, Zach Wilson is not good at football. We get it. But like, can we look at the entire operation? It's donkey crap. If I'm Robert Sala, I can't let Zach Wilson fog up the glasses and say, bro, Nathaniel Hackett stinks. The offensive line stinks. So that's just my opinion. The Jets defense is awesome. Jets defense is elite. They shut down Justin Herbert in a way that I've rarely seen in the NFL. That was impressive. Like, they were after him in the pass rush. Their coverage was phenomenal. The run game couldn't get going for the Chargers really at all. The only way the Chargers scored, they scored a punt or a kick, ret a punt return, a punt return. They got two fumbles near the 50-yard line. They scored on one of those drives. They scored late off of a fumble return by the defense. The Chargers tried to give the game back to the Jets too. They fumbled multiple times and the Chargers somehow ended up with it. I don't know if the Jets have the Dallas Cowboy gene where they can't pick a fumble up, but man, this game would have been close to the end if it were not for Two fumbles, Garrett Wilson fumbling early in the game where they were driving inside Charger territory, a fumble by Zach Wilson, a strip by Joey Boza, and a punt return. If this game goes into half at like 10-3, we got an entirely different game. It might not even be 10-3. 
So, like, I just feel Chargers were the better team. Chargers didn't make mistakes. That's why they won. The Jets made a boatload of mistakes. They were at home. They fumbled it multiple times. Punt return on special teams early. The Jets have to play from in front. They don't want to play from behind. They can't play from behind. You're not going to win with Zach Wilson and this offensive line from behind. It's not going to happen. But really, I think people got to talk about the rest of the damn offense. I mean, is anyone watching what I'm watching here? Like, it's unbelievable. Brandon Staley looked like an ace coach and defensive coordinator out there compared to Nathaniel Hackett. So, yeah, Chargers look like a team that I think I've underrated over the last couple of weeks just for the fact, like, they can beat bad teams. They can comfortably beat bad teams. And Justin Herbert is good enough to the point where he'll make a few plays. He won't turn the ball over. He's smart. He can overcome what's around him at some points. And the defense actually doesn't look like a disaster when they're playing bad quarterbacks, which is a good sign, and and they're improving. You know, the one thing I'll say about the Chargers, their run defense this year is actually a lot better. I do have to give them credit for that because I've ripped into Staley continuously for that. So credit the Chargers for what they were able to do and get away with the victory. The Jets were a horror show tonight. Absolutely disgusting to watch. Next, Germany. Credit to the fans in Germany, man. That game, just I immediately turned it on and I I covered it live on the BLV. It felt it had a Super Bowl like tangible feel to it I don't know if it was the entrances or like the field or just because it was a neutral setting but it felt like a Super Bowl like it really did and it it allowed me to predict or project a Super Bowl in Europe at some point I do think that will happen at some point as for the game Well, if we didn't already know it, the Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins are frauds. Can you please? I don't want to hear it about the Miami Dolphins anymore. Please do not rank them in your top five in your power rankings. Please remove Tua from MVP. Rip that ticket right up. The Miami Dolphins are a bunch of pansy, soft, fake, fugazi, Miami Dolphin. Just a, what a team that is, man. The team stinks. They are all smoke and mirrors and all scheme on offense. As soon as Tua has to participate in a third down, he pisses himself. As soon as the game is close, in the fourth quarter, what do we see? Tua turned the ball over. He turns into a big fish. He flops all over the damn field. Nobody wants to see that in Germany. What the heck was that pass he made? Cedric Wilson wide open. What the heck was that, bro? I mean, how many plays in a row consecutively did Tua just piss himself in the fourth quarter? And this, the funny thing is, Miami's defense played well in the game. They didn't allow a single point in the second half. They actually played pretty well in the first half. But the Miami Dolphins, offense, the a great offense, best since the Patriots or the Broncos in 07 and 13, creative genius head coach of an offensive schemer, can't score against the 2023 Chiefs, bro. Are you kidding me? Get that shit out of here. You guys can't beat anybody. That's good. You can't beat a single team above 500. Your record is a 
fraud. It's fake. It's phony. It doesn't exist. It's pixie dust. What I see is 0-3. If you want to give them the Charger win after they beat Zach Wilson, okay, congratulations. 1-3. Their record, if you include the Chargers, the teams that they have beat are 12-28. and The Miami Dolphins are not elite. They're frauds. Please, stop. I want to give credit to the Miami defense. I think Vic Fangio is doing a good work. I think Jalen Ramsey has really elevated this unit. They returned Xavier Howard and Javon Holland for this game. I didn't even see Travis Kelsey. Did Travis Kelsey play in this game, bro? I guess because Taylor Swift wasn't there, Travis doesn't play that well. I guess, I guess Travis just... He just waits for when Taylor's there. Or maybe the dude is so, 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 so out of it now that he's in the, wherever he is. Well, what does Taylor call it? The Wonderland? He's somewhere over there. And he's out of it. He didn't even want to go to Germany. He was he was still stuck back in the States, bro. Tra- Travis, where are you at? Where are you at? I didn't find you at all. Where Did you play? Someone I knew who played is the Chiefs defense. I know the Chiefs defense was playing. They dominated the fake, fake great offense of the 2023 Miami Dolphins. Give credit to the entire unit. Spags, phenomenal coach. I've been saying it for years. Great hire in 2019. Super creative guy. He's only evolved with time in Kansas City. His game plans, he's a great game plan coach. He's a great big game coach. He knows what he's doing, man. The secondary to me is what I want to focus on. You know, like, George Karloftis has been great this year. Breakout year. Charles O'Meny, who's been very good. A great pickup for them. Chris Jones is Chris Jones. We get it. Their linebackers are good. The secondary makes everything work when I watch them. The the amount of man coverage they play at a high level is impressive. As someone that values man coverage, probably more than 99% of football fans, I think man coverage is mandatory to winning a Super Bowl. If your team cannot play a little bit of man coverage, I don't think your team can win the Super Bowl. I'm just going to be honest. Unless you have like the 07 Giants defensive line, then maybe you can get away with it. But honestly, like, you've got to sprinkle in some man coverage at times because if you just sit back and play zones, these coordinators and these top play callers in the league and these schemes and these motions they're utilizing now, it's just too hard to play zone all the time. They're going to pick you apart and give easy throwing lanes and wide open players for guys like Tua who are secretly ass, but they're just, they're fluffed up by this great magical pixie dust scheme that Miami has created. The Chiefs were playing man against Tyreek and Jalen Waddle. They were forcing tight window throws. They are forcing Tua to hold it. They are forcing Tua not a wide open throw in a tight window. McDuffie and Snead are both top 15 corners in the league. I like the Watson kid. They got another guy as well. I think it's Williams. He's pretty good too. The safeties are very talented. That was a game-changing play. That McDuffie punching the ball out of Tyreek Hill. The lateral from Mike Edwards, former Tampa Bay Buccaneers Super Bowl champion, lateraling it to Brian Cook for the touchdown. Clutch. And that's what the Chiefs defense is to me over the last few years. Clutch. They always step up in big games. That's the exact opposite of the Miami Dolphins. And then you've got the offense of the Chiefs. Let's stop pretending. Okay? Let's stop, Ultra. Let's stop pretending that this offense is some great unit. I- I'm going to pull it up right now. I-, I would be doing a disservice to the entire audience right now if I did not do this. The Kansas City Chiefs defense. 
offense. Okay, so they currently rank 12th in points per game. Wow. Okay, they are booty cheek. Let's take a look at this. All right, the Kansas City Chiefs offense, bro. 20 points against the Detroit Lions. 20. You got 17 against Jacksonville. Wow. Okay, you play the Chicago Bears. 41. Okay, great. Does that even count? You played the damn Bears. 23 against the Jets. Okay, so that's 1, 2, 3 under 24 points. 27 against the Vikings. Okay, congratulations. It might be your best output of the year. 19 versus the Broncos. That's actually kind of sad. 1, 2, 3, 4 under 24. Okay. Uh, then next, you got 31 against the Chargers and Brandon Staley. Okay, clap it up. <laughs> then you've got 9 against the Broncos. Okay, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 games below 24. Okay. Then you play the Miami Dolphins. You get 21 points, bro. 21 points. Seven of them were from the defense. And you have, you're out yardage. You had 267 yards in the damn game. The Kansas City Chiefs offense stinks. Their O-line is good. But then every once in a while, they'll have like a jailbreak where Mahomes is running around in circles. The O-line the and the run game has regressed in recent weeks. The receiving core is a bunch of ass. I mean, you, you might as well have the 06 Patriots out there. N uh, you know, better yet, the 2023 Patriots out there. The tight end, he's out to lunch. I mean, he's in Wonderland. We already discussed this. And Mahomes, I mean, I don't even blame the guy. I can't even say much. He's got one guy and a rookie and... A guy that's kind of, you know, a lunatic, Kadarius Tony. Andy Reid, this short yardage offense is a piece of poop. They can't do anything. They can't move the chains. They can't run the ball. They don't quarterback sneak. They refuse. I don't know. I'm concerned about the Chiefs offense. Miami's defense hasn't exactly been great. Now, they played well in this game. I thought they played well against New England. But that's kind of easy to do. I don't know if you guys have noticed. So we'll see how they continue to evolve. But I will say this. Miami, fraud and a half. Kansas City. Defense, legit. Defense, really good. Defense, top five. Quarterback, elite. Tight end, goofball. Offense, stanky. Stanky. Average, mid. Next, what do we want to talk about? I think we need to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys. Because I was watching this game with my pops, not down here, up there, with the family, having some food, and man... The Dallas Cowboys, they are frustrating. The Dallas Cowboys are something. Because I felt like they outplayed the Eagles. I felt like they outgained them 400 to 292. I felt like they moved the ball more consistently. The Eagles did not gain a first down in the fourth quarter at all. The Dallas Cowboys had like three or four chances to win this game. And you still got to give credit to the Eagles for the win and say like the Eagles find a way to win. This is what they do. This is what they've done all year. To some degree, this is what they did last year, although it felt more impressive and thorough last year than this year. I think you also have to say Dallas looks like a legit contender, but you also have to question whether or not Dallas can actually win against these teams. 
Like, never mind the yardage. Never mind the first downs. Never mind the red zone trips. Never mind all of it. The Cowboys statistically outplayed the Eagles. My question is, we've seen them get their asses kicked by the 49ers. They played really well against the Eagles, I felt like, especially on offense. And they still lost. What does that say about Dallas? What does it say? I am confused. Does that mean they're good? It was in Philadelphia. I mean, the 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 damn refs were clearly, clearly on the side of the Philadelphia Eagles. And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, I mean, they got a little touchy-feely, if you know what I'm talking about. Go check on Twitter. Go, go on any video platform. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, MySpace. It doesn't matter, bro. Look it up. Kevin Byard and Ref. Just look it up. And you tell me. Because I was complaining in the Discord. I was kind of trolling Eagles fans. But at the same time, because we have a few Eagles fans in that chat. I was kind of trolling them. But like at the same time, every call seemingly went to the Eagles. It it at least felt that way until the very end. And then you got the damn ref feeling up Kevin Byard for a good 30 seconds on the tush. I mean, what are we talking about here? What is this? Now, to me, it looked like Dallas was going to win. It actually felt like Dallas was going to win, especially near the end where the the Cowboys get the stop. You know, they got stopped multiple times on fourth down. They get the ball back late. Dak's driving all the way down the field. They actually end up getting to the five-yard line, the six-yard line. They have a first and five at the six-yard line With 26 seconds left. A lot of time. I don't think they had a timeout. But 26 seconds left. Or maybe they had one timeout. 26 seconds left. First and five at the six. The way the offense was moving the ball. It felt like a foregone conclusion Dallas was going to win this game. But you just had a seed in the back of your mind. That the Eagles pass rush. The Dallas Cowboys might choke this. And it's a testament of the Eagles, but also the Cowboys. Like, Dak, you can't take a sack. You can't take a sack. I really don't want to be ESPN here. I don't want to be Skip Bayless, Fox, uh, wherever he's at now. I don't want to be Stephen A and talk about Dak sucking because Dak was phenomenal the entire game like pretty much he made two mistakes in the entire game and it cost the Cowboys the game he took a sack where he should have thrown the ball away you've got to throw the ball away you have to get rid of it it doesn't fucking matter you've got to get rid of that ball you can't take a sack there for the yardage purpose and also the time purpose you can't take a sack it's just too hard to convert in the red zone if you take a sack Does anyone watch Tom Brady? Like, God, it just kills me. Like, it honestly pains me. I watch guys like Zach Wilson. I I even watch my own quarterback, Mac Jones. I watch every quarterback in the league. And it feels like there's only a handful that actually understand what taking a sack means to a drive, a play, a sequence, a moment in the game. You can't take a fucking sack. Everyone on Twitter is going to talk about the right tackle and the offensive line and all this stuff. And everyone blames the offensive line for that. (sighs) That's the quarterback. You got to get rid of the ball. And then that's why the quarterback's the manager of the game. And that's why that's not a slight. Secondly, the play on fourth and eight with the game on the line earlier in the sequence. Dak Prescott has man coverage 
Looks like they're double teaming CD Lamb, so he decides he's not going to go to CD Lamb. And you can see that on the on the broadcast. Brandon Cooks is one on one. That's an option. You've got it looked like a some sort of like conversion in the middle of the field, like one of those like seam posts in the middle of the field by Ferguson, who's great all game. Ferguson had a really strong game, and he's really evolving into a secondary target for the Cowboys. There was a lot of positives for the Cowboys in this game, and I'll get to those. But like, there's there's that seam post, whatever. He's he's breaking in the middle of the field. He's wide open. I mean, wide open for a first down for Dak Prescott. He he beats his guy. He is open in the NFL. Dak does the thing what Dak does where he turns into a robot. Like he doesn't have that quarterbacking sense sometimes where, okay, CD's, CD's doubled. Okay, yeah, so it makes sense. Let's move off of this. But then what Dak does is he turns into quarterback robot where he's like, okay, the second read in my progression is I got to throw this comeback route to Jalen Tolbert one-on-one. Am I going to throw to Jalen Tolbert with the game on the line against the Philadelphia Eagles on fourth and eight? Like, I like Jalen Tolbert. I like what he did. I think he's better than Michael Gallup. I think he showed that. But am I going to throw that low percentage pass compared to, okay, let's look at Ferguson, who's been money for me all day. I like this matchup. The Eagles linebackers stink. Their safeties are not much better. Let's look at Ferguson. Let's see if we're going to get him open. Why do we have to look at that? Like, bro, have a little sense. At least look to the middle of the field first before you go to the right. I mean, that was a mistake for me by Dak as well. But, I mean, Dallas just, with Mike McCarthy, they've they've gotten so much better, so much more organized, so much more consistent as a football team. Dan Quinn's brought so much to the defense, especially... But it feels like with McCarthy in these last moments, in these final moments of the game, in these two-minute situations, they take penalties. A delay of game in that situation is unbelievable. You can't do it. You can't take it. A sack, unbelievable. Can't happen. Right? Like, we've seen it over and over and over again with the Dallas Cowboys in these clutch moments. And some of it, I think, is Dak. Some of it, I think, is the coaching. But that is to say, that's to take away everything that went well for the Cowboys in this game. C.D. Lamb was phenomenal. I mean, there are a lot of great receivers in the NFL. A.J. Brown is one of them on the Eagles, who had a touchdown once again in this game. But mostly, actually, A.J. Brown didn't dominate this game. Like, believe it or not, A.J. Brown was good, but not great in this game. And I thought the, the Cowboys especially Bland, did a fantastic job. Devontae Smith was rather quiet outside of a touchdown, and I think Gilmore was covering him for most of the game. Their corners really did a great job, especially in the second half against those guys. CD Lamb is right in the conversation of a, a top seven receiver in the NFL. I mean, you've got Tyree Kill, You've got A.J. Brown, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. After that, you probably got Stephon Diggs. I think C.D. Lamb is right there. I might be missing someone. I think that C.D. Lamb is as good as... I think he's as good as Stephon Diggs, honestly. That's saying a lot, too. Like, I think he's right there. He's six, he's seven, he's eight in the NFL. He is that good. He is really awesome. And they had to double team him near the end of the game because he was just going off. Like, he couldn't be stopped. Play after play after play. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching the Cowboys and I'm like, this is what the Patriots are missing. I'm watching this game. I'm like, this is what the Patriots are missing. Like, I'm thinking in my mind, like, People are going to, you know, people are talking about Mac and all that stuff. But, like, the Patriots don't have a guy like this. You can't just throw any guy on the Patriots his route every play against the defense. Like, we used to be able to do that to Edelman or Gronk. Now, the New England Patriots don't got that. And you need that in the NFL. 
for all that it matters to have a great defensive line and a great offensive line, if you don't have a dominant weapon, you are not winning the Super Bowl. If you do not have one player that is at least one, and I would argue you need two, but if you do not have at least one, and that I would say if you have like a Tom Brady, which is not possible, if you have like an elite of the elite quarterback, let's say you have a Mahomes or you have an Allen or you have a Lamar, maybe Burrow, right? If you have one of those guys, maybe you can get away with one, but you also have to have a good offensive line, a bit of a running game, right? A good defense to win the Super Bowl. If you have... Two, you're really cooking. But like, you need at least one of those guys that on third down, in the red zone, every play is a mismatch. He's going to get open. C.D. Lamb is one of those guys. A.J. Brown is one of those guys. I'd argue Devontae Smith is pretty close to being another one of those guys, and he's on the same team as A.J. Brown. One issue I saw for Dallas was their right tackle. Horrendous. Terrence Steele has is, is actually been a pretty good player, Terrence Steele, of the Cowboys over the last couple of years. He's been pretty good. In this game, he was horrendous. He allowed 12 pressures, 7 hurries, 4, not 1, not 2, not 3, 4 sacks in Week 9, according to PFF. His pass block grade was a 15. So to me, I watched this game. And I see Dallas get near a two-point conversion by Dak Prescott where he steps a foot out of bounds. Unlucky. Straight up unlucky. It's really nothing the Eagles did. It was just unlucky. If they get that two-point, they're kicking a field goal at the end. This game goes to overtime. Who knows who wins? It was that close. There was a fourth down and eight that they could have converted. They didn't. There was a guy open. Dak had to make the right read. He didn't. They got down to first and goal at the six. They didn't convert. They got to a fourth down and basically an inch away from converting the first down with Schoonmaker. They didn't. So Dallas felt like the better team. Dallas, to me, passed the test in terms of, that's why I picked them. I think one of you asked, Mitch, why'd you pick the Cowboys? I'm like, I think the game told you why I picked the Cowboys. I said CeeDee Lamb would go off. Dak would have a good game. The defense would do a pretty good job. I think I was accurate. It just so happened that the ball bounced the wrong way. And I think I will be picking Dallas again when the game is played in Dallas. I think there is a difference between home cooking refs in Philadelphia, touching up the bum bums of Kevin Byard, and then also... The, the fast track of Dallas, the dome of Dallas, instead of playing outdoors on kind of a grass field. There's a different feel to that for Dallas. Dallas is a speed team. Philadelphia is a power team. So there's some differences. Jalen Hurts, credit him for powering through a difficult leg injury, knee injury. But nothing really stood out to me about Philadelphia in this game other than what they always do. Their run game didn't actually play that well. Jalen played pretty good overall. I didn't think he played bad by any means. A.J. Brown didn't have a phenomenal game. He played good. Devontae Smith played fine. The defensive line played really good in moments. They had a bunch of sacks, and they were super clutch. Brandon Graham being one of them. Seen that before. The secondary is weak. It can be sliced. Swiss cheese. I'm worried about that against elite teams. But this says a lot about Dallas, way more about Dallas. I think they can play with anyone, but it comes down to those moments that I will not be trusting them in that big game. Those moments of crisis that I can't trust them in. Let's move on. I didn't make a graphic for the Bengals and the Bills. I forgot for some reason, but we're just going to riff. So if you're looking for the graphic, I apologize, but I'll post a chapter here for you guys. The Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals, Sunday night football. 
it pretty much went according to plan. This was my biggest bet of the NFL season. And I won a good chunk of cash on the game. And I was very excited. And I was chatting throughout the game because I wasn't live. I was chatting throughout the game on Discord with Ultra and and uh, uh, mostly Ultra, but Lenny and Dirk Han in there. And the Cincinnati Bengals, there's just no denying how good this team is. This team is absolutely legit. And, and to me, they're one of the most fun watches in the NFL. I just love watching Joe Burrow and the way that he coordinates this offense. It feels just like nostalgic for me. That's the best way to describe it. It feels like a lost art, what Joe Burrow does on Sundays. It feels like a nostalgic feeling of watching Peyton Manning with the Colts or, or watching Tom, right? It, it, it feels like Drew Brees. It, it feels like those guys. And I'm not saying Joe Burrow is quite any of those guys, but he's a fantastic quarterback. And the way that he goes about it, the control he has at the line of scrimmage, it does feel a lot like Peyton in terms of it's a pretty static offense. There's not a lot of motion. A lot of it is three receivers. You know, in Peyton's day, it would be Marvin, it would be Reggie, it would be Stokely, it would be Dallas Clark. And then it would be the back, Edron James, right? And for Burrow, he has very much a very similar built team. He has Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. He has Tyler Boyd. He has not really the tight end, but a really good running back, Joe Mixon, who, again, super freaking clutch, man. And Joe Mixon is back, by the way. Joe Mixon looks better than he did last year, 100%. Looks back to 2021-2020 pre that form where he was one of the best running backs in the NFL. I don't think he's quite that, but he is damn good. He always makes people miss. He's good in the receiving game. He's good as a rusher. He's super clutch. He always seems to come up with the big play or the first down when they need it. Has fantastic vision. But I just love watching Joe Burrow. And it's just surgical the way that he goes about it. Pass, quick pass here, quick pass there, 20-yard chunk here, 20-yard chunk there. All right, run the ball a little bit, run the ball a little bit. Screen game, 5-yard, 8-yard, 9-yard. It's just surgical. The ball's where it's got to be. It's out, it's quick, it's decisive. It's just he reads it, he sees it, he throws it, and it's accurate. It's perfect mechanically. Joe Burrow is nostalgic. That's what he is. And... This is a Super Bowl caliber team. They've got all the pieces. I talked about you need one weapon that every defense has to game plan for. The Bengals have more than one, right? Jamar Chase is that guy who everyone unanimously game plans for. But as we saw in that game against the Bills, if you're going to shadow towards Jamar Chase, double Jamar Chase... T. Higgins can get 100 yards. Tyler Boyd can get a few big chunk plays in the game and strike, right? And then you've got three different tight ends contributing. Tanner Hudson, a disciple of Rob Gronkowski from Tampa Bay. Irv Smith, the worst football player in the NFL other than that right tackle for the Jets. And you got Wilcox also doing it. You've got Joe Mixon in the run game. Effective, efficient, clutch. A defense that's opportunistic, that's well-schooled, that always is in the right spot, that has a great game plan. Situationally fantastic. Great in the red zone. Very good on third down. Can get after the quarterback. Linebackers are amazing. Cam Taylor Britt interception is that dude. Love his play this year. The Bengals are that team, and and it never felt like the Bills were in any control of this game. They were always chasing. They were never going to win this game. At no point did it feel that way. The closest it came to them coming back 
was when Dalton Kincaid fumbled the ball, and I think they were close to the red zone, and they were close to making it a very interesting game. But I, I still feel like in the end, Joe Burrow was going to make the plays against the Bills defense that was necessary to win the game. This offensive line for the Bengals is also a little bit underrated. It's solid. Love what I saw. And it, it was a projection of what I saw for the game. The Bills defense is not good. We knew this. I told you this. Post Matt Milano, post Tredavious White, post Daquan Jones, they're not very good. They're just not very good. Sean McDermott, I think he's got to go. I think Colin Cowherd made a good point. There's a cap to coaches as well as quarterbacks. There's ceilings. And McDermott's ceiling is the divisional round. It's at best the AFC Championship. He's a good coach. He's a good manager, mostly of the game. He's a good defensive coordinator. He's missing something. He's missing an offensive edge, and the style of defense he plays puts him at a disadvantage against his greatest competition. He leans into zone coverage. And it just doesn't work against Mahomes. It just doesn't work against Burrow. It's just not going to work against the elite quarterbacks. So, I think they got to think seriously about Sean McDermott moving on. Shout out to Dane Jackson. I thought he played well for the Bills at corner. And we'll see how they play with Rasul Douglas in there more often. I feel like their defense can improve a little bit. And I felt like they were actually a tad more competitive than I expected them to be in this game. I thought it was going to be Swiss cheese. I thought it was going to be a knife through butter. I thought it was going to be that easy. It wasn't quite that easy. But there was a control to the game that the Bengals had. On the other side, there nobody should have a take about Josh Allen other than the fact that he's probably the most valuable player in the NFL. Without Josh Allen, this team is a bottom five, bottom seven team in the NFL. They're that bad, in my opinion. The offensive line constantly gives up heat in bad situations. The receiving core outside of Stephon Diggs is pretty mid. Dalton Kincaid has gotten better at tight end, but he's a rookie. The defense is bottom five in the NFL over the past four weeks. That being said, if you think the Bills are going to miss the playoffs, I just can't see it because of Josh Allen. There were moments in the game where I was like a little scared. I'm like, wow, like this guy is just that good. Like he is going to pull off some wins down the stretch you don't see coming. That's what he's going to do. They play the Chiefs. They play the Eagles. They play the Cowboys. They're going to win one of those games, even though they're much worse than all of those teams. He owns the Dolphins. So that's my takeaways from the game. Bengals are legit. Bills are a pretender, but they have an elite quarterback that's capable of doing it all. And there's there's time to move on from people. And I think Sean McDermott's under that category. Next up. Let's talk about Josh Dobbs, man. What Josh Dobbs was able to do versus the Atlanta Falcons was pretty special. And I really want to talk about Kevin O'Connell and the Viking coaching staff. Josh Dobbs made some phenomenal plays in this game. He had an incredible fourth and seven scramble. Like absolutely insane near the end of the game that won them the game. He found Powell for the game winner. He made numerous scrambles in this game, made numerous plays, made a few throws. He was basically learning the offense on the fly. He was running the offense in a backyard fashion where O'Connell and his teammates were basically telling him, okay, X is running a slant. Y is running a go. You know, like Z is running... I don't know, like, a comeback. Like, bro, this guy was running plays in the dirt, in the backyard, like, doesn't know what they're called. He's just reciting them, and he's getting the routes through the ear, and he's getting it from Kevin O'Connell. And Kevin O'Connell, to me, I think seriously has to be considered for coach of the year. This guy has been phenomenal. Every time I watch him, I thought he was unbelievable in the Niners game. He took Steve Wilkes to school. 
His play calling is great. And I think his his composure is phenomenal. I, I remember when they drafted this guy. The New England Patriots drafted this guy. And all I heard about him was how smart he was. How high his IQ was. And man, you see that as a coach. And not only do you see that, you also see that as like as a leader, he's got a confidence to him and an energy to him that's very positive. And I feel like all of his players probably really respect him because he feels like another player on the team, like another guy on the team, another dude on the team, but he's just got the authority, but he's he's very confident in his players. And he's willing to take it to his opponents. And that's why I think he brought in Brian Flores. Because Brian Flores is a coach, a defensive coordinator, who I think you could argue is the assistant coach of the year. Kevin O'Connell could be the coach of the year. And I think Brian Flores could be the assistant coach of the year. I guarantee you that 99% of NFL fans could not name five defensive players on the Minnesota Vikings. They have next to zero talent. There was multiple times early in this game where Josh Dobbs was just being acclimated to the offense, where the Falcons had red zone opportunities that they were not able to cash in on. There was an interception by Byron Murphy that was huge in the game. There were multiple big stops and big plays made by the Vikings defense. Brian Flores has been phenomenal all year. And he is taking chicken shit and making that presentable, right? And I just feel like Brian Flores and Kevin O'Connell right now are one of the best tandems, offense, defense, in all of the NFL. And that's why the Vikings have a chance for the playoffs. Kirk Cousins was great when he was in this year. You lose Kirk Cousins. The team vibe is down, but you never got that sense. No Justin Jefferson. Your two best players are hurt. Josh Dobbs comes into this team on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Doesn't know he's going to play. You're teaching him on the fly. The players, the culture, the surroundings, they uplift him. They make plays for him. Garrett Bradbury, phenomenal game at center, calling out the checks, calling out the protections, doing his thing and helping Josh Dobbs. He never snapped the ball to Josh Dobbs before. I mean, so much credit to O'Connell, who was giving the plays at the line of scrimmage to Josh Dobbs, was giving the checks to Josh Dobbs, was telling him, okay, watch Addison here, watch Osborne here, watch Powell here, watch Hawkinson, what? Whatever it needed to be, okay, go from uh, go from X to Y to the back. Like, whatever he had to do, he was, like, talking to him up until the snap, basically. And the pre-snap efficiency, which he touched on in an interview with Pat McAfee, he said the number one importance this week for Kevin O'Connell was pre-snap efficiency, which is we need to get out of the huddle fast. We need to get to the line fast so that our quarterback can figure this out. And that's exactly what they did. They took one pre-snap penalty offensively with Josh Dobbs, which is unbelievable. Like, this is unbelievable coaching. This is great coaching. This is an example of great coaching. If you want to know what great coaching is, it's this. It's it's adapting. It's altering your plan in the middle of the game. It's crisis management. That's what it is. It's making sure that everyone around you is confident, even if it doesn't appear that it's going to be any good for you. It's taking a safety. Right? It's taking a safety if you're Josh Dobbs and still overcoming it. It's fumbling the ball in your red zone and Brian Flores making a stop. His defense stepping up. And then on the other side, I've been a Arthur Smith fan. But I have to say this about Arthur Smith. The man makes no sense in the world. Like Arthur Smith, I don't know what type of arrogance surrounds you. I don't know what is in your brain. I don't know what you're thinking, brother. You are going to get yourself fired. First, you tell us that Desmond Ritter is the next coming of Michael Vick. And then you start Mr. Heineken. So obviously you were wrong. Your your front office, you, you had no idea to go out and 
make a trade for a quarterback or go and sign a quarterback this offseason that would have been better than Desmond Ritter or Heineken. Mistake number one. Number two. There is a guy on your team named Bijan Robinson. He is a phenom from Texas. He was a phenomenal prospect, as good as any running back that anyone has seen in years, compared to Saquon Barkley as a prospect, compared to LaDainian Tomlinson, compared to the likes of Adrian Peterson. You have Bijan Robinson. And on your most important plays in the game, on the goal line, you run Tyler Algier. I mean, if that is not a fireable offense, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. So the difference in this game, we've got Josh Dobbs who's throwing to Tristan Jackson. No idea who that is. We've got the Pastronaut being the best quarterback in this game. And that is a fault of Arthur Smith because he did not go get a quarterback. Secondly, we've got a better offensive coordinator in Kevin O'Connell over Arthur Smith. Third, we've got Brian Flores, who's a better defensive coordinator than Atlanta's guy. Because, why? Josh Dobbs, go watch the highlights. How many times did he just roll to the right? Josh Dobbs had, I I, want to say, eight plays where he rolled to the right and created a big play for the offense. And a majority of the offense's biggest plays came by scrambling to the right. Rolling to the right. Can you not adjust to that? Contain the pocket? Keep the guy in the pocket? Make him go through reads? He doesn't know the offense. Like, sometimes coaching is simple. And sometimes people make it look very hard. And when it's hard, that's when you see who the great coaches are. That's Kevin O'Connell. That's Brian Flores. Freaking great job, guys. CJ Stroud. I've talked about CJ Stroud a few times this year already. You know, like, I'm not one of those guys that comes on to the BLV and says... You know, I was right, this and that. I told you this. I told you that. But, man, I told you CJ Stroud would be a star. I literally made a video called CJ Stroud will be a star in the NFL. He is a superstar. I told the Carolina Panthers... Do not draft Bryce Young. Draft C.J. Stroud. What do these guys do? They proceed to make the dumbest decision and draft Bryce Young. Over C.J. Stroud. Not only is C.J. Stroud a star, Not only is C.J. Stroud a superstar, not only is C.J. Stroud already a top 12, I'm being conservative, top 12, probably top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Not only is he a future multi-time pro bowler and potentially all pro and maybe even an MVP. I think he could be that good. Not only is he that, He is the greatest rookie quarterback since Andrew Luck, at the very least, and he might even be better than Andrew Luck. No quarterback since Andrew Luck has been tasked with winning games like C.J. Stroud at the rookie quarterback position. Not Dak, not Mac. I wouldn't even say Herbert. None of those guys that had good rookie seasons. And I'm missing some, but you get it. Burrow, right? None of them were 
asked to make the throws, were asked to throw 45 times, were asked to throw for 400 yards and five touchdowns to win games. That's what C.J. Stroud is doing. And he's doing it with composure, with a sense of calm, with leadership, with passion, with a fan base on his back. How long have the Texans waited for a quarterback like C.J. Stroud? They had the devil of the Sean. And now they have the angel of CJ. 470 yards, five touchdowns, eight 20 yard completions in the game versus Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay going into this game was a top 10 defense in the NFL. Tampa Bay is a Super Bowl winning defense. You think about all the players, and they're not in their prime exactly. But let's think about all the players that were on a defense that embarrassed Patrick Mahomes in a Super Bowl. Think about it for a second. Jamel Dean, Carlton Davis, Antoine Winfield Jr., Levante David, Devin White, Vita Vea, Shaq Barrett. I'm probably missing a couple. That's seven starters. Seven. They played a rookie quarterback who had maybe the best day of any quarterback I've ever seen play Todd Bowles' defense. C.J. Stroud had 470 yards and five touchdowns. That was as good of a performance as we've ever seen, maybe only rivaled by like Matthew Stafford in that divisional game in 2021. That's about it. I can't recall a better performance than what I saw from C.J. Stroud. Not against some bad defense. Not against some inexperienced young defense. He played a top 10 defense with a bunch of Super Bowl champs on it that have been in the system, in this league, have played at a high level, have played Drew Brees, have played Aaron Rodgers in the playoffs, have played Matthew Stafford, have been there, have done that, right? This guy went out there and he slings it. Rockets, piss missiles. All over the field. This is one of the best rookie quarterbacks of all time. Top 10 quarterback in the NFL already. Calm, composed, and deadly accurate. Everything I said he would be entering the NFL. And I see tweets. Oh, you couldn't have projected CJ Stroud would be this good. Bro. Watch the damn tape. There's a game against Georgia. And if you're going to take any any game at the college level, watch the one against Georgia. Because how many dudes that were going to be in the NFL were on that defense? CJ was forced to do things in that game that he would be forced to do in the NFL because of the talent disadvantage. It showed you what a guy could do When he was in a situation where he had to carry a team. CJ wasn't always put in that spot. There are glimpses throughout his college career in spots throughout the games. I watched all of his senior tape. It's it's there. It's all there. The off-balance throws. The outside, the pocket throws. The deadly accurate passes down the field. The quick game. The composure. The pocket toughness. It's all there. I describe it all in the video. For you guys to miss that is incompetence. For you guys to say that Bryce Young, who's slow and small, was better than CJ Stroud, I'm dunking on your ass, bro. I am dunking on your ass. Because it didn't make sense then, it doesn't make sense now. CJ Stroud was built for the NFL. CJ Stroud has a better arm, he's more accurate, he's bigger, he's tougher, he's calmer, he's smarter, he's everything better than Bryce Young. There's no comparison. It's not close. He's faster. He's quicker. He's tougher. He's smarter. He's a better leader. There's nothing that Bryce Young does that is better than C.J. Stroud. You could make arguments in college. I think the college argument would be off-schedule plays, 
quickness inside and outside the pocket. Other than that, I would argue nothing was better about Bryce Young in college. Other than maybe the logo on his helmet that people fall in love with. the Or the, the logo that he plays Alabama, right? Let's go through a bit more of this game, right? So the second play of the game, the second play of the game, and CJ really didn't take off in this game till the second half, but the second play of the game, Devin White, who runs a 4-5, is running full speed, untouched, at CJ Stroud. CJ Stroud, which people said he couldn't do, just just avoids Devin White. No big deal. 4-5 speed, doesn't matter. Avoids, De avoids Devin White. And what does he do? Something that Dak Prescott, one of the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL, does not do. Throws the ball away. Under pressure. He's a rookie. He avoided a sack. He didn't force the ball down the field. He didn't try to throw a crazy pass down the field. As a rookie, he threw the ball away. You see his game on the run, his ability on the run. How many times in this game did he deliver off of play action on the move in the Shanahan-style offense of Slowick here? And that absolutely destroyed the Bucs in this game. They were dicing them up on Moving the pocket, rolling the quarterback out of the pocket, throwing on the move, dicing them up. This game, guys, was 17 to 7 halfway through the second quarter for the Bucs. This game was 20 to 10 in the third quarter. This was a comeback. This was a comeback. Third and nine, extending the play. Six minutes left in the second quarter. He throws it away in Tampa Bay territory. Understanding if he takes a sack, it's going to be a longer field goal. We might actually have to punt if I take this sack. How many quarterbacks do you see not have that situational awareness of understanding? I don't have to force anything here. I'm avoiding a sack. I'm extending the play. I'm seeing if I can get anything to go. And then the, the awareness to... Run around, extend the play, nothing is there, give up on the play, throw it away. The kicker got hurt in the game. Losing by 10 twice. 470 yards, 5 touchdowns. Noah Brown, long crosser, huge play in the game. Perfect double move pass to Tank Dell for a touchdown. Love Tank Dell, by the way. Tank Dell is a stud. Love this combination. The Texans failed two two-pointers. They still won the game. Stroud to Schultz on fourth down. Ice in your veins. Touchdown. It's just unreal how he puts the entire team, the entire offense on his back, and he goes. It really feels Andrew Luckish when he was a rookie. Shout out to Ogun Bale, who had a field goal in this game as a running back. That's pretty impressive. CJ Stroud to Tank Dell all the way down the field for the win. Unbelievable. Rookie to rookie versus this team in that moment. Super impressive. As for the Bucks, I feel bad for Baker. I thought Baker played really well in this game. I thought Rashad White played really well in this game. Mike Evans made a number of plays. The Bucs offense played really well. Probably the best game they've played all year. And I felt bad for Baker because he's been through a lot, honestly. And he's been having a good year. And it feels like the Bucs players really respect him as their leader right now. And that's only going to grow for him right now. I thought he played great. He put his team in a position to win and his defense let him down. And we need to give Baker credit when he does well. Because he doesn't get enough credit because all the time he usually gets ripped apart. And I felt like Baker did a great job in this game. And he gave his team a chance to win. Kate Otten looks like he's evolving as a tight end option for them. But it was all about CJ Stroud in this game. Unfortunately for Baker. It was just his moment. It was his time. It was meant to be.
Now let's transition this conversation to the other two rookie quarterbacks, Bryce Young, Will Levis, that we saw this week that are of high importance. Bryce Young, two pick sixes versus the Indianapolis Colts. I'm going to go through my notes pretty much verbatim. You guys carry with you whatever you like. Carolina's trying to run the ball a lot early. Not really working. Okay. First note. Houston is fine being carried by C.J. Stroud. The Panthers know they have to run the ball or they're toast. The Panthers got a muffed punt early on and didn't capitalize. Didn't capitalize on a big turnover in the game early. DeForest Buckner ruined the entire game. That's just DeForest Buckner being a beast. No Panther points in the first quarter. Falling behind early. Sack on first down. Second, a batted pass. And I put, you have to throw it away on the sack. And second down deflected. Minshew was the better, more mature, composed quarterback. The Panthers' D played well with good effort. Michael Pittman absolutely got destroyed in this game by Xavier Woods. Random point, but huge hit. Third down, extended the drive, uh, turned it into a better drive for the Colts. Carolina had 12 total yards in the first quarter and a half into the game. 13-3 would have been the score if Bryce Young didn't throw a pick six before halftime, which turned it into 20-3. So the pick six pretty much killed any sort of hope in the Panthers winning the game. 13-3 could have been the score going into half. Instead, it's 20-3 with a terrible throw. To Kenny Moore for a pick six. Bryce Young always does this. And he's done it multiple times as a rookie. Where he no looks a pass and throws it right to the other team. That was the first interception. The second interception. After the game's 20-10. to 10, Where Bryce actually has a good drive for the Panthers. And they go down the field and they score. There's a nice throw on fourth down on an inbreaker to uh, Tommy Tremble. Okay, so there was one good throw in the game by Bryce Young compared to about 25 by C.J. Stroud. There was another horrible pick six. I mean, horrible. It was a screen pass. He threw a dart straight on a line. Oh, you know, usually a screen pass, you kind of like find an angle. You just dump it to the back. He's throwing the ball like this, like full speed. Throws it right to Kenny Moore. He runs it back for 65, 70 yards. Touchdown. Bryce Young... He's going to be mid at best. He's just not it. He's small. He's not tough. He's really kind of indecisive right now. He, yeah, doesn't have a lot of help, but arm strength is an elite. Accuracy is an elite. His decision making and his like showmanship is taking over actual quarterbacking play. Holds on the ball too much. Doesn't elevate anyone around him. Bryce Young's not a good football player right now. He's one of the worst quarterbacks in the NFL. The other guy on Thursday is kind of promising, Will Levis. He's not C.J. Stroud, but I really liked what I saw from Will Levis. He played in a really tough spot. He played the Pittsburgh Steelers on Thursday night, primetime, standalone game. Mike Tomlin, T.J. Watt, Cam Hayward back in the lineup. That's a really good defense. That's a really hard place to play in Pittsburgh on the road, primetime. Terrible offensive line. I thought Will Levis made a number of nice throws. He nearly made a full comeback in the game. He had a couple really nice drives at the start of the game, near the end of the game. I thought he actually played better in pure passing situations than he did against Atlanta. It's just the fact that he was so good off play action against Atlanta that people didn't really notice that he wasn't great on third down. Um, and he just feels like an NFL starter and a Titans quarterback. He's big, he's strong, he's tough. He kind of has an effort attitude. He's not maybe not the smartest, but he has a good game sense to him. I would like to see him run a bit more, but man, 
I like Will Levis a bit. I wasn't a huge fan of him coming out. I thought he was, yeah, okay. He has some tools, but he's very raw. I really like what I've seen. I think his accuracy has been pretty good, better than I expected. And I like him in this offense. Run the ball, play action, shots down the field. That's Will Levis for you. So Will Levis right now is better than Bryce Young. And I don't think it's even debatable, to be honest with you. I I really don't. I think CJ Stroud is all-time special right now as a rookie. Bryce Young is not it. And Will Levis, he's maybe it. So that's my stance. Next, the Raiders are back, baby. The Raiders dominated Tommy DeVito (laughs) and the New York G-Men. Just the Raiders, man. Firing Josh McDaniels, moving into the future. Antonio Pierce. I told you guys during the pick show in my best bet show, I was so positive about this Raiders team because I could just tell there was something tangible. It was a feel. It was an energy. It was a passion. It was the the faces on the players. It was the energy that you saw when it Pierce was talking to them. And you saw that in the post-game speech by Pierce. You see Devontae Adams lighting up. You see him getting excited about the culture, about the team. You know, this is Antonio Pierce, a guy that was a really good player in the NFL, a Super Bowl champion in the NFL with the New York Giants, came from a winning program, knows what it takes to win, played a tough physical brand of football, an old school gritty brand of football. But not only that, he was a fan of the Raiders. He knows the Raiders. He knows what the Raiders stand for. He's from Compton. He knows the community. He knows the fan base. He he grew up in it. He loves it. That is great, man. That's a great story. And I don't know how good of a coach Antonio Pierce is, but one thing I do know is that guy has energy. That guy has a toughness. That guy has a tangible grit. That guy has a no-nonsense attitude that you look at him and you say, that is a leader. That is a guy I want to go to battle with. That is a guy I respect. Respect is such a key word as a leader, as a coach. And McDaniels didn't have it. Pierce has it. Looking at the team, man, I thought Josh Jacobs looked great. He looked juiced up. He looked ready to go. He had energy. I thought Aiden O'Connell played well. He made a number of nice throws. I thought one awesome throw down the field to Tucker. Trey Tucker looks like a real player. Great speed down the field. Vertical threat for the Raiders. Hunter Renfro made a sighting. Uh, Jacoby Myers had a touchdown, which was very sad because I'm a Patriots fan. And every time I see this guy do well, it makes me think of how we signed Juju Smith-Schuster over him. Devontae Adams really did nothing, and it didn't really matter. And there was no drama, which was nice to see. The offensive line for the Raiders played better. This is a Giants defense that was playing really well, and the Raiders kind of did their thing early in the game. Defensively, Max Crosby, three sacks. Max Crosby is as good as any defensive player in the NFL. I don't want to hear it. He is unbelievable. This guy is unbelievable. His his motor is unlike anything I've seen since maybe J.J. Watt. Play after play after play after play. The guy is in the backfield, tackling the running back, sacking the quarterback, pressuring the quarterback. The guy's motor is insane. Like, that is a trait. That is Max Crosby. That guy is insane. I mean, there is no pass rusher that brings it on a play-to-play basis like Max Crosby. It's unbelievable, man. It's every week. It's every game. It's consistency. It's every snap. Um, They stopped the tush push of the Giants. Congratulations. Tommy DeVito. He's pretty bad. I don't understand how the Giants came into that game figuring that Tommy DeVito was going to be the quarterback if Daniel Jones got hurt. That is malpractice. And honestly, this is the main point of this topic outside of the Raiders. They're back. They're fun. They're at least going to be a respectable team for the rest of the year. They're going to play hard for their coach. They're going to play hard for their fan base. And they're not that terrible. Uh, I think their defense has played well all year. And I think if their offense can get something going, we saw what Aiden O'Connell can do. He's got a vertical threat. He, he can throw the ball down the field. He's got arm strength, right? He may make mistakes, but he can thread it in there. Unlike Jimmy Garoppolo. He's not a disaster like Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, and next week's a huge game. Monday Night Football at home versus the Jets. I would take the Raiders there. They're, they're at home. So, anyways, with the Giants. Brian Dayball's having a terrible year. A- and I don't care if it's injuries, whatever it is. You can't have Tommy DeVito as your quarterback if Daniel Jones gets hurt. You've got to make a signing. You've got to bring someone in. You've got to have someone prepared. Tommy DeVito is a XFL quarterback, bro. 
XFL, CFL, maybe. Brian Dayball has lost it. He's he's lost his ego. He's lost it, man. Like, I I like Brian Dayball. Think he's a great coach. He has not been good this year. His offense has not been good. His O line has not been good. His team has not been good. And he has a very bad vibe about him on the sidelines. It's just off. It's not the same as last year. It's it's different. I don't like it at all. The Ravens are flat out ridiculous. The Ravens are the best team in the NFL right now. And it's not particularly close. Like this team is utterly dominant. Right now, they rank third in NFL history according to DVOA through nine games. First is the 07 Patriots. Second is the 91 football team. Commanders don't know what to call them at this point. And then number three is the Baltimore Ravens of 2023. They have no weaknesses. Their defense is unbelievable. I mean, I don't know if I watched a single series where I was like, the Seahawks knew what the Ravens were doing the whole game. Like, I was like, the Seahawks, they're confused. Geno doesn't know who to throw the ball to. He doesn't know how to read this play. He doesn't know what to do. Like, he's lost. The Ravens had him confused all day long. Seahawks couldn't really run the ball. The Ravens were all over all of the Seahawks concepts. And I've been saying for a while now, the Seahawks offense a little concerning, a little basic. Good defensive coordinators will break it down. That's what we saw in this game. The Ravens pass rush, man. Most sacks in the NFL, it's because of the coordination with the coverage. There's plays where Geno is like looking in the middle of the field. Then he's looking to his next read and he's like, shit, I can't throw it there. So I got to like tuck the ball. And for, before you know it, Kyle Van Oy's there. Kyle Van Oy. He has five sacks through six games this NFL season. Five sacks through six games. His, his career is six and a half sacks. He's playing like Julius Peppers in his prime. Jadavian Clowney's playing great. Matabuke's playing great. These guys are playing phenomenal up front. They can't be ran on. Their secondary is good. Roquan Smith's the best linebacker in the NFL. Don't at me, Fred Warner fans. This team is really good. And then offensively, who the hell is this Keaton Mitchell guy? He's got 18 rockets up his rear end. The guy's fast as hell. You're going to combine Keaton Mitchell... With Gus Bus's power and Lamar Jackson's quickness on the edge, you got to worry about Lamar going right and Mitchell going left. Oh my goodness. And then you got Odell Beckham turning back the clock, scoring a touchdown on his 30th birthday. Congratulations to the legendary OBJ. Always been an OBJ fan, man. Congratulations to your 30th birthday. Congratulations for that touchdown. He looks better and better and better every week. He's running better routes. He looks quicker. He looks faster. He looks more explosive. Remember, he lo- he missed a whole season last year. It was going to take him some time. It looks like he's getting back to form. And Zay Flowers didn't do really anything in this game. Nelson Aguilar was very quiet. Mark Andrews had a huge game. Eight catches for, I think, 89 yards and a touchdown. Mark Andrews is the engine of the offense, but they have so many different options they can go to. From Gus and Mitchell now to... Odell to Nelson Aguilar to Bateman made a couple catches to Isaiah Likely had four catches to Zay Flowers. I mean, they have so many different guys. Devin Duvernay is a gadget guy. Like, how do you stop this team? And then defensively, they're the best defense in the NFL historic unit. They got stars at every level right now. Geno Stone picked off Geno Smith, which was phenomenal. His sixth pick of the year. And you look at these interception stats, you're like, yeah, no wonder because they're just confused the whole game. Quarterbacks are confused. Mike McDaniel has them like in a blender the whole game. In a blender. They're sending five-man rushes and there's just no one open. And Lamar is phenomenal. Lamar is phenomenal. He's just so good. I mean, good luck sacking the guy. Good luck. He double clutches. He's doing this thing in the pocket where he's like double pumps and then he like throws off his back foot. Perfectly accurate pass. I mean, good luck. You got the MVP. You got the best defense in the league. You got a running game. You got a passing game. I mean, who's beating the Ravens now? They, they are playing peak football. Peak football.
All right. The last thing. Stink. Stank. Stunk. The New England Patriots. How can I even take you seriously? You lost to the Washington Commanders. A team that's changed their name two times in five years. A team that has a new logo every week. A team that has a coach that was made by Cam Newton, who you ran out of your building. Who your fan base disrespected. There were reports that the commanders want to trade for Belichick. Belichick just lost to Rivera. But most of all, I want to say this. Because Mac Jones' hatred, Mac Jones' syndrome was at a peak, man. An absolute peak this week. Let's just blame Mac Jones for everything. We're back to that now. It's just too much for me. I don't know how much more I can take with the fucking Mac Jones is the entire problem with this team. I don't know how much I can take, guys. I've said it once. I'll say it again. I've said it a million times, man. If you're going to blame anyone on this team, you can say Mac Jones is bad. That is fair. I'm not even going to argue that. Okay? I'm not even going to sit here and argue that right now. Bill Belichick is the only person you should be blaming. Bill Belichick is the general manager and the head coach of this football team. The roster is not good, especially on offense. The offensive roster is a fucking disgrace. Their offensive line actually wasn't awful in this game because, I don't know, the commanders traded two really good edge rushers Imagine if Sweat and Chase Young played in this game, how many points we would have scored. This man, Bill Belichick, rolls into an NFL season with this receiving core, with this offensive line, and expects to score points and win fucking games. It's undeniably a disaster. You've got guys like Jalen Reger, running consistent routes. You've got one knee Juju who can't catch. You've got a sixth round rookie looking like by far the best receiver on your team right now. It's not even close. You won't even play your other one, Kayshawn Booty. I don't know why. He's in the doghouse. Usually that's where you put your best receivers. Kendrick Bourne was there last year. So you can blame Mac Jones all you want, guys. It's whatever. I hear people say Mac Jones sucks. Mac Jones, he's so bad. Like, people that cover the NFL bet on these games. Like, all they talk about is Mac Jones sucks. Bro, are you watching the game? Like, do people actually watch these games? Like, do people watch these games? Jonathan Vilma is sitting there blaming Mac Jones for throwing a perfect pass into the hands of Juju Smith-Schuster for basically a tying kick opportunity. He puts the ball right in the middle of his hands. Juju drops the ball. Juju takes the blame at the end of the game and still people are blaming Mac Jones for throwing the ball because Jonathan Vilma said it. So it allows you to say that Mac Jones sucks. Anything to say that Mac Jones sucks. He missed one throw the whole game to Tyquan Thornton on a corner route, which I'm not all that sure was not because Tyquan Thornton stinks and can't run a route. I mean, you see Tyquan Thornton run a fucking route. This is the guy that Bill Belichick put in the damn second round. He picked this dude. He picked this guy. 
Guys, he picked this guy. This wide receiver. He can't run a damn route. He can't do it. He stinks. And then you've got a big drop by Jalen Rager right in his hands. 50, 60-yard bomb by Mac Jones. Perfect throw. One of the best throws he's made all year. His receivers make no plays. His receivers don't run good routes. Other than Demario Douglas. His receivers don't catch the ball when they're open. His offensive line barely can protect. His run game stinks. Stevenson had a great carry for a touchdown. That was awesome. Yeah, blame Mac Jones for everything. The receivers dropping the ball. The offensive line not being good. The defense sucking. I mean, the defense fucking sucked. They allowed like 350 yards to Sam Howell. That's embarrassing. And why did they suck? Because our defensive head coach sits our two best, maybe our two best corners, but at least two of our three best corners. Why? I don't fucking know. Someone let us know, because Bill won't. He deploys Marte Mapu, a linebacker at safety. What's with all the zero blitzes against Terry McLaurin? I mean, what the... And then every time it's a zero-man blitz, they go to Jahan Dotson every every single time. And what do you know? We got Miles Bryant covering him. If we just simply remove Miles Bryant's carcass off of the football field and place Jack Jones on the football field, we win the game. It's really that simple. You don't have to do anything else. You can go through all the all 22 you like. You put Jack Jones on the field. You take Miles Bryant off the fucking field. You win the game. How many high leverage plays did Jahan Dotson make a play or Terry McLaurin make a play because we have shit corners because we have Miles fucking Bryant? He stinks. Why is he on the field? He sucks. The offense sucks. The receiving core is the worst in the NFL. By far. It's not even close. We don't have one good receiver on our team. I just talked about it. You can't win a Super Bowl without a number one receiver. And oftentimes you need a number two. The Patriots don't even have a number three. They have a sixth round rookie receiver at number one receiver. And, and then people are like, it's Mac Jones' fault. He sucks. Watch the game. The first drive of the game, the first three throws are perfect throws by Mac Jones in the hands of these receivers. And it's super tightly contested. We've got the Washington Commanders playing man coverage. Are you kidding me? They drafted a bust in the first round. And we were targeting him because that was our game plan, understandably so. But we have no receivers that can actually get past the fucking worst player in the first round of the 2023 draft. Like... Dude, we can't even attack a corner that stinks because our receivers are that bad that they make them look good. Every pass is contested. Every pass is tightly covered. No receivers can run a route. Like, I don't understand what people watch on the damn TV, dude. Like, yeah, Mac isn't Mahomes. He's not great. Dude, he's not... He, I wouldn't even categorize him as good, okay? He's average, but he he's not the biggest problem with the team. And I'm not even going to say that I want him back because if we're going to play this way, if we're going to draft sixth round receivers with our first priority at a wide receiver, if we're going to wait till the sixth round to draft a receiver, I need Cam Newton in 2015, I need Lamar Jackson. Like, no quarterback is making this shit pile look good. You need a guy that's going to run. You need an athlete to be able to overcome this shit. Like, you can't do this shit. Not even Tom Brady could make this team a playoff team. This team fucking sucks. And the receivers 
blow, and the offense sucks. Mac Jones is not good or great. He's average. But the guy has to do more than any quarterback when throwing the ball because every single time his receivers are covered like a fucking blanket. Every time. It's got to be Dan Marino. Like, dude. There's like two or three plays that are open. The commanders disrespected us to the degree that they played man coverage. I mean, oh, God. Ron Rivera. I just don't get it anymore, bro. I, I don't get it. I don't understand what people watch. I don't get it. I don't understand what Belichick is, is watching. I don't, I don't get it, man. I'm I'm done, bro. I, I'm done. This team sucks. I... Can't win a close game, man. Because our coach is an idiot. Our coach is an idiot. And I didn't even bring this up yet. Our special teams. What the fuck? We go offside? We have the highest paid special teams in the NFL. Like, huh? Who are you paying? Pay a receiver. Bench, J bench JC Jackson. Bench... Jack Jones, you bench Wes Welker in the 2010 divisional round. That's why we lose that game. You bench Malcolm Butler in the Super Bowl 51. That's why we lose that game. You're just taking rings away from Tom Brady. At the end of the day, that's all you're doing, Bill. Now, as for the Mike Vrabel report, I would love that. I love Mike Vrabel as a coach. He's a great coach. And he actually understands that you have to have an offensive weapon to win in the NFL. He's a good defensive coach. He is the, I would argue he is the best game manager in the NFL. In terms of clock management, he is the best clock manager in the NFL. If we got Mike Vrabel, I would be pumped. That being said, we would need an offensive coordinator and I'm, I'm to the point where I like Mac Jones and I hope he goes somewhere else and does well. I want a new quarterback too. We need to start over because this is not working. And I think Robert Kraft is finally fed up. That is all. Week nine. Didn't think we'd get to this point. Peace, guys.